Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you have not already done so, please silence your phones. I hope you'll join us next Wednesday for History's Lunch, which is being co-sponsored by the Mississippi Humanities Council and is part of the department's year-long initiative exploring the Great Migration. Deborah Douglas will present Forth and Back, the Great Migration Roadmap to Resistance and Reclamation. And remember the exhibition, A Movement in All Directions, opens this weekend at the Mississippi Museum of Art and admission is free this weekend. And then please join us next Friday, April 15th at 2 p.m. here in the auditorium when Joseph Iwudzi and Carla Shedd will present Getting Something to Eat in Jackson. Iwudzi is a professor at Davidson and his book, Getting Something to Eat in Jackson, Race, Class, and Food in the American South was published last fall. He was scheduled then for history's lunch until the Delta variant spiked, but we're excited to have him Jackson native and City University of New York sociologist Carla Shedd, as well as some of the Jacksonians portrayed in Woodsy's book next week. I'm also excited about the food from Chef Enrica Williams and the book signing that will follow the program. So I hope that we'll see you all back here for that. Today, we are delighted to have Alicia K. Jackson to present The Land of Promise, North Mississippi and the Hope of Refuge. Alicia Jackson is Associate Professor of History at Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. She earned her BA from Centenary College, her MA from Louisiana Tech University, and her PhD from the University of Mississippi. At Covenant College, Jackson leads the student-based District Hill Cemetery Project, which focuses on recovering the lost history and stories of the vibrant black Chickamauga, Georgia community. She is the author of Having Our Own, The Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, and The Struggle for Black Autonomy in Education, which was published in Southern Religions, Southern Cultures, Essays Honoring Charles Reagan Wilson by University Press of Mississippi, who also published her first book, The Recovered Life of Isaac Anderson. Help me welcome Alicia K. Jackson. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and the opportunity uh, to speak here and to be here. And um, it's so funny, uh, someone came up to our table um, and uh, asked, where are you from? And I am from Louisiana, that's where I grew up, but I feel really at home uh, here in Mississippi. Um, this is my paternal uh, family home. Uh, my family um, is originally, my, my dad's family is originally from a Tyler Town, Mississippi. Uh, and I can count a number of summers uh, spending uh, visiting my grandparents, but also every other Sunday we would uh, visit my grandparents uh, there and visit with cousins and make our special gumbo out of all kind of things we found. And so anyway, it's just an honor to be here and to be able to uh, share this history, which is so, so important. Well, um, I, I do uh, want to uh, talk a little bit uh, about sort of my family connection to this in the sense that I grew up hearing stories. I grew up hearing stories from my paternal grandparents, but also from my maternal grandparents as well. And they told me stories about, um, particularly my grandfather on my mother's side told me about um, John the Conqueror stories and told me rare rabbit stories. And these stories were not stories that were just, you know, he read out of a book, but these were stories that he was told by his grandparents who were born right after slavery. And he even got to meet his great uh, grandfather who was born in uh, enslaved um, and um, would share these stories with him. So it is in that context that I grew up hearing stories and really fascinated about family history and what stories could tell us. And I think that's part of the reason why I was so drawn to uh, this project, um, which um, is the title of my talk today is The Land of Promise, looking at North Mississippi and the Hope of Refuge. But it's part of the reason why I was so drawn uh, to the story about Isaac Anderson. So um, I was working on my dissertation <clears throat> several years ago. We won't talk about how long ago that is now. Uh, and uh, I um, had centered my dissertation on the CME Church, 
which was founded in 1870 as the uh, Colored Methodist Episcopal Church. And it was an offshoot or daughter church of the Southern Methodist Church. Anyway, um, I was researching them. I had initially become in intrigued with this denomination um, as I was working on a paper for uh, Charles Reagan Wilson's class on Southern religion and I had ventured up to Holly Springs and I noticed in the small community uh, these two HBCUs right across the street from each other. And I was so fascinated that on one side you had Mississippi Industrial and then you had Russ College on the other side. And so I was really curious about that. Um, and um, so that got my started interested in the, the CME Church, which today is known as the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. So um, in the process of doing my dissertation, I traveled up to Jackson, Tennessee, and it was there that, um, which is, uh, that's where Lane College is located. It's a CME school uh, as well. Uh, and um, anyway, I was going through the archives, and there I found this mimeograph paper um, that had the picture of Isaac Anderson, not this picture, but another one. And as I looked through the brochure, I was really curious because of uh, it laid out some really interesting facts about a man I had never heard of, but it talked about um, Isaac Anderson and his, his career, um, his involvement politically, which was uh, what I had always learned that CMEs did not do, that CMEs were not involved in politics, but this was someone who was actually elected to the Georgia legislature. So it challenged that idea. Um, also in, within the little brochure, um, there was no reference to his mother, which was really interesting, but there was a reference to his father. And so, you know, I was working on my dissertation, so I hurried up and, you know, Okay, that's nice, but wait, I used his story in about a page of my dissertation uh, in regards to, yes, this is an example of someone who is a CME who's involved in politics. So I was like, okay. So got that dissertation done, started working, had a child, daughter, then son, and then daughter teaching. Uh, but then I just kept going back to what is this story and kept wondering, who is William Jackson Anderson? I mean, why is this? Is this somebody I should know? I mean, tell me his story. I'm supposed to know everything, right? Um, but uh, of course, I don't know everything. So that got me more and more interested. And so I fell into a rabbit hole. Um, as uh, many of you who do genealogy are well familiar with. Um, and I should say that I have become a huge fan of genealogists uh, after this. Um, because I have learned so much about how to do research and how to find information. Because the thing about Isaac Anderson is that there was no diary, there were no papers, there were no records, um, you know, that I could go to that was owned by him or some, you know, the papers that I could go back through and sort of recreate his life or understand his life. Um, so that would mean that I would spend well over a decade uh, researching his life. Um, again, this is all from scratch. Um, and uh, so I visited the Mississippi Department of Archives, and I visited the Georgia Archives, and I visited the archives in Arkansas, just a number of places I visited. Um, I even got to visit an archive uh, that was located uh, in a, a former prison. Uh, and I was, it was, really, it was a really interesting research trip because um, when I went there, again, it's in a former prison uh, building, and I went in there, and the, uh, the, uh, the person who's in charge of the facility, she had told me I was only the second person in that, that year that had actually visited. Um, so as I went into the recesses of the, of the archives there and went into the very, very back into one of the cells um, where some of the documents were kept, um, and it was pretty dark back there. Uh, that was an interesting experience. Um, and she almost gave me a heart attack when she came around the corner to check on me uh, because, you know, it was very quiet there. We'll just put it that way. Um, so it's been a, 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 a journey in terms of telling his story that has meant me traveling all over places and oftentimes dragging my family with me, uh, whether it means visiting cemeteries or former prisons and things like that. But either way, the story of Isaac Anderson and sort of the bigger work um, is a recovery effort. 
Um, and I think that's just one of the hallmarks of the type of work I like to do uh, is recovering stories, particularly uh, African-American stories, um, and particularly in the rural South. It's very, very interesting um, to me. And it, it probably hails from uh, the roots I have, my family roots uh, in rural parts of Mississippi, as well as South Georgia. But either way, my book um, and the project um, as it progressed um, would challenge a lot of the notions and ideas uh, that people had about whether it be the CME church or African Americans um, during the Reconstruction period. Because one of the things that I found as I was working on the book project is that the story about black leaders, particularly uh, in Georgia during Reconstruction, was that they acquiesced. And again, Isaac Anderson had served in the Georgia legislature. Uh, and so the idea was that black leaders, again, acquiesced, that the CME church acquiesced to white leadership, to the Southern Methodists. And as someone who grew up in the black church, I just could not buy that because I know that black people would have got up and walked out, and that, 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 that would have been the end of that denomination, uh, particularly during the period of time of Reconstruction uh, in the early 20th century. So my work challenges those ideas. My work also talks about the central role of the black church um, and um, how the black church was a function, functioned in the black community in so many important ways. Uh, the book also talks about the ideas of memory, um, and how those memories are preserved, how they're forgotten, and why they're forgotten. Oftentimes, it is tied to issues of trauma. The book also gets into talking about with the intra-racial tensions that you have within the black community, uh, whether it be the struggle between Isaac Anderson and the more well-known CME leader, Lucius Hosley, the, the tension that you have within the CMEs, which again represents a larger tension within the black community about white paternalism and challenging those ideas. So Anderson is a, a really sort of good venue to be able to talk about that. Well, let me say a little, a couple things about him um, and then we'll get into talking about the meat about this connection to Mississippi. So Isaac Anderson was born in 1835 in, in um, Monroe County, Georgia. Uh, he served as the registrar uh, in nearby Taylor County. He had served in the Georgia Constitutional Convention from 1867 to 1868. Uh, he would uh, run uh, for office in 1868, but would lose that election uh, in 1868. Uh, but later on, two years later, in 1870, he would win election to the Georgia legislature. Uh, eventually, he would leave Georgia uh, and moved to Mississippi, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, and then would spend the last of his days uh, in Jackson, Tennessee. Now, the story of Isaac Anderson uh, really starts with the, his father. His father, which again was a name listed on that, that paper, William Jackson Anderson, uh, was not only his father, but also was his white master. Uh, and um, the two men, as I began to research William Jackson Anderson and learn more about his, him and his life, realized that in many ways they were total opposites. Um, because his father um, uh, supported, William Jackson Anderson supported the Confederacy. Um, after emancipation, uh, his father uh, had supported the convict lease system. Uh, William Jackson Anderson had also supported the ousting of the black legislators who had been elected, duly elected in Georgia. Uh, probably most notably, some of you are probably familiar with Henry McNeil Turner. Uh, Reverend Henry McNeil Turner was one of the number, roughly about 33 African Americans who were uh, ousted from the Georgia legislature. And William Jackson Anderson was one of the ones that signed off on that to say yes. Um, so all of these things that he is supporting in many ways are antithetical to his son. And so I work out some of those things um, and the relationship and the complicated relationship. That's a part of the story as well. But I had to start there in terms of understanding who Isaac Anderson uh, was. And it's part of the reason why the book is a micro history. Um, it gives sort of a, it's a, a venue to tell so many things that are part of the African-American experience. Well, um, you see, again, this is Isaac Anderson, a picture of him here. Um, well, eventually, um, Isaac Anderson would actually, uh, his, uh, William Jackson Anderson is elected to the Georgia legislature uh, and serves as state senator uh, from the Fort Valley, Houston County area. 
uh, but was ousted because of his support for the Confederacy. And just two years later, his son would win his father's seat. And there is, I have not seen anywhere in the historical record where there is any other example of where you have a father and son diametrically opposed to each other in terms of political, hold, uh, political office who both serve in the same seat during Reconstruction. So that's another, that's a part of the fascinating part of the story as well. Anyway, so he runs for his father's office, um, father's seat and wins. Uh, and um, one of the things that you're gonna see happen is that um, eventually Isaac Anderson is going to have to flee Georgia. Now, part of the reason why he has to flee Georgia has to deal with a piece of legislation that was passed in 1866 in Georgia um, that said it was essentially illegal for anyone to encourage someone um, to seek employment elsewhere. It was a misdemeanor offense. The reason being, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this history, but I'll just say this a little bit, um, is the fact that there was such a need for labor um, and African Americans were wanting to be able to negotiate their wages. Um, and um, they're, you know, they wanted to do that. Some people had the hope maybe that 40 acres of mule might come to fruition. Um, so they're holding off on signing contracts and they just don't want to go back to anything akin to slavery. So you're going to see that the Georgia legislature would pass this piece of legislation in 1866 in order to harness back black laborers to Georgia. Okay, and so, you know, so most Southern states did this, but this is one of the things that you see happen in Georgia. Now, how this is particular to Isaac Anderson and why this is so important to his story and really makes it just such a remarkable story is the fact that in 1873, you're going to see that leaders within the community that he lives in propose a bill that is passed in Georgia that effectively gives the ordinary the position, the ability to be able to place anyone um, essentially on the chain gang. Now, you probably say, okay, that's nice. How does this have anything to do with him? Well, the reality is, is that Isaac Anderson was leading blacks out of central Georgia. And he was leading them to Arkansas, and he was also leading them to North Mississippi. And they were, he's leading them there because of opportunity that was held in these other places where African Americans had more uh, rights and, uh, and abilities. And we're going to talk about that, unpack that a little bit more. So in 18, well, 1873, he makes a public proclamation saying, I am not involved in leading black people out of Georgia when all actuality, he gives a particular location when actuality he is. Okay. So, to give you a sense of why this is, you know, sort of part of the story and why he would do this, is that life in Georgia for freedmen and women uh, was so hard and so difficult. Initially, black individuals had sought refuge in the, the black church, um, and uh, whether it be the AME, AME Zion, or eventually the CMEs. And they sought refuge in the black church, not only because of the conditions of slavery, but because of what they were experiencing during Reconstruction the horrendous um, conditions that we're going to talk about in just a minute, but they saw the black church as a refuge. Because one of the things that they really understood is the fact that if they attended white churches, um, and these white ch churches that they were attending, particularly that were Southern Methodist churches, were very open in telling the members of the black community, don't get involved in politics. But black people are saying clearly they've got to get in politics because they have to protect their rights. They want to engage in what it means to be an American. So it's not only because of the issue of slavery, but it's because of what is going on during Reconstruction. And you see the rampant disenfranchisement that's going on. Whether it means in the going, people going to the polls in places like, uh, and again, I focus primarily on Georgia during this period, uh, which Reconstruction sort of effectively ends where you have democratic control is by 1872, so it's well before Mississippi. Okay. So you have black individuals who are targets of violence um, and the polling, I mean, it's just, it's a nightmare in terms of actually going to vote. You also see in Georgia the introduction of the apprenticeship system. Uh, and again, I focus in on Fort Valley area. Um, as you have the targeting and harnessing of young uh, black children uh, to work. 
Uh, so effectively, the ordinary, who was a white individual, would come in and say, well, this child is not being properly cared for by their family, so um, we're going to apprenticeship them out to a white family. And the idea is that white family would teach them a trade. Well, the trade was work in the field or taking care of the home. Uh, and serving as a servant. And the idea is also too that they would get an education, which if you look at many of the census records, um, it's clearly indicated those children are not getting any kind of education. So that's going on. You, of course, you have the convict lease system, low wages. You also have the Ku Klux Klan, which by 1872 in Georgia is replaced by the state militia. Um, and uh, because they can effectively come in and they can maintain control, maintain uh, quote unquote law and order there as they're being supplied weapons. Um, by uh, the state, uh, the governor. Because okay? again, by 1872, it's effectively under democratic control. So again, black people are looking for safe spaces. AME, AME Zion, the CME Church are places where blacks are trying to find a place of refuge. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting and fascinating, and there's lots of scholarship on this, but I definitely found this in my work, is that you see that black pastors and ministers are looking for places to give refuge to black individuals, um, so, uh, or to, for them to find refuge. So Bishop Henry McNeil Turner eventually becomes a bishop. He talks about Africa and talks about Liberia as a place for African Americans to find refuge, safe spaces where they can live and not be in an oppressive condition. You also see people like Martin Delaney and eventually Lucius Hosley talk about creating all black states, places like Oklahoma, where black people can breathe and function. Um, and of course, you also have um, all black or majority black communities established, Boldy, Oklahoma, Eatonville, Florida, Mound Bayou, Mississippi, or Cameron Place, Alabama. So one of the things that you see happen is that in sort of the north um, Mississippi, primarily focusing in on Panola County um, and Tate County and Marshall and Lafayette County, those areas become areas of refuge. Uh, and we're going to spend a little time talking about that this morning. So with the Mississippi Delta slash Hill Country, there are a number of things that are drawing, there, drawing people to be there, um, and it has to do with economic opportunity. Okay. So it's not just political, but economic opportunity uh, as well. Uh, and so a part of it is the fact that um, individuals can work um, in the lumber industry. Uh, by working in the lumber industry, they can... Um, you know, by this, at this time in the Mississippi Delta, it has massive forests of oak and hickory. Um, they, people need workers to clear the land. Okay. Um, you also see railroad construction. There is uh, the Central Illinois, Louisville, New Orleans, Texas Railroad Company uh, builds a railroad line through there in order to get those, those, that lumber out of there, but you have that railroad uh, system set up there, including uh, the Sardis and Delta short line. You also have the growth, especially once that land is being cleared out, uh, for cotton production. Uh, and so by 1889, you see the high uh, prices in cotton, uh, which was 160% higher uh, than just uh, 10 years earlier. So all of these things encourage leaders within those communities to white leaders in those communities to try to get black individuals there, um, to have them work in these areas. And so that means that there is a measure of sort of un maybe uncomfortableness with black, black individuals being there, but they need that labor there. So they're willing to tolerate that. And you do see black individuals being able to really acquire, accumulate a significant amount of wealth um, in these areas as well. So um, how this plays out in my little thing here, it's a little, it's a little skewed here. Um, I thought I had lined it up perfectly. But if you look um, at Mississippi Delta and Hill Country, um, so if you look at Panola County, um, you see the, what the black population is. Oh, so to be, oh, it really went off center here. Um, and so it's 16,490. That should be Panola. Tate does not have a uh, population there because um, it hadn't been created yet. And then Marshall has 12. Um, 1,585, and then you see uh, the, and for a total of 29, a little over 29,000. Um, and then, the, and we'll just go with the last measure. So the white population in total is 21,000 um, in Panola, Tate, and Marshall County. Down here at the bottom, 
the number's a little bit better here, so the center a little bit. Uh, in 1880, um, the total black population in Panola, Tate, and Marshall County is well over 46,000. The white population is uh, well over 29,000. Uh, so what you see is that these are counties that have a significant black population located there. And so African Americans, again, this long tradition of trying to find safe spaces. First safe spaces in their churches. When that doesn't work, we've got to find some place where we can live. And so these particular areas become areas where you're going to see African Americans um, relocate to. And so we'll look a little bit um, at um, some of the folks who are tied to this. Um, I should say there are some things that are going to be sort of initial drawers to um, black individuals there. One is the fact that you have places where you have uh, freedmen bureaus located. Um, also union and loyal leagues, which were leagues that um, organizations that were created uh, to encourage people to be part of the Republican Party. Uh, and of course we're talking about the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln at the time that uh, was very much supportive of African American rights and was uh, total opposite of the Democratic Party, uh, which uh, at this time uh, we're talking about uh, was supportive of the Ku Klux Klan. And a number of leaders in the Democratic Party uh, were a part of the Ku Klux Klan. And again, that's during this period. Of course, we're going to see a change in that by the time we get into the mid-20th uh, century, especially by the 1960s. There's going to be sort of a flipping of that. Either way, um, you're going to see that there are going to be a notable uh, residents of Panola County, particularly in places like Sardis and Como. Uh, J.H. Piles, um, who is a Republican, uh, he was born in Ohio, uh, attended Oberlin College, studied law, uh, was a Union League leader, uh, and eventually in 1875, um, he would uh, become Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, and that's after he had been elected to the Mississippi House of Representatives. And the reason why I bring up um, piles and settles is to help you to understand that there are people who are outside of the South who are moving to Mississippi because of opportunity. And it's not just economic opportunity, but we'll see in just a minute um, as I talk about some political opportunity as well. Uh, so you also have Josiah Settles, um, who uh, was uh, the first class, he was, a, he was a member of the first class of Howard School, uh, of course, come out of Howard University, uh, law school there. He also served as trustee of the D.C. schools, and he would move to Sardis uh, in 1875. Uh, he was a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1876, 1880, um, and eventually would run um, as an independent uh, in Mississippi in 1883, where he would win a seat in the House, Mississippi House of Representatives. Settles, interestingly enough, and this is, this is also too, that's really fascinating about this story, is it also connects with Memphis. Eventually, Settles would relocate to Memphis, Tennessee, um, has a really uh, interesting relationship with Ida B. Wells, and I think it's all because they're living in the same proximity to each other during this time in Mississippi. Um, of course, Ida B. Wells is from Holly Springs. Uh, for a period of time, Wells um, lives with Settle and his wife in Memphis, but Settle would uh, relocate, eventually re relocate to Memphis later on. But again, moves to Mississippi because of opportunity. Uh, by 1869, there are mixed race juries in this county, which, I mean, if we think about, and I will say this as an educator, when I tell students this about Mississippi, they're like, Mr. Who? Because uh, they just don't think of Mississippi being like this. Um, maybe Georgia, they think of that, um, but I tell them Atlanta is not Georgia. Um, but, you know, it's, they don't think of this as being Mississippi. And so it's really, I think for maybe a lot of academics and historians, maybe a number of you, this is not new. But I think for most people, this is just sort of blows their mind. Um, you also have a county board of supervisors from 1871 to 1877 that are black. Um, and you also have individuals, uh, Felix Elridge and M.G. Littlejohn, Circuit Clerk, Circuit Clerk and Chancery Clerk, who are African American as well, who are in from this area. Uh, so, again, there is political opportunity because one of the things that you see happen is that not only is it economic opportunity, but it's also political, a measure of political opportunity there as well, which is going to be a draw for a number of people to this area. So other people that I know many of you are familiar with, James Hill, who is Secretary of State, 1873 to 1878, of course, hails from the um, um, 
Marshall County area. You have High Rebels, Blanche K. Bruce, uh, James K. Lynch. Um, you have eight black state representatives and senators from 1873 to 1880. And of course, Ida B. Wells, who hails from Marshall County. So all of these things are, again, really important to understanding the, you know, the really sort of rich history of African Americans in Mississippi and why there would be a large number of black individuals, which you saw those numbers, who would move to Mississippi for opportunity. Um, so in Holly Springs, um, one of the things that happens um, is uh, you're going to see that eventually Isaac Anderson is going to settle uh, after he's ousted, I mean, after he really essentially flees Georgia, he flees Georgia by 1873. That's when his term ends. He serves his time in the Georgia legislature, um, signs off in support of the civil rights bill um, that's hotly contested. He's very vocal in his support for the, uh, for the civil rights bill uh, to the point where he and the last um, lone uh, black state senator until the 1960s, because he's the only um, they're the only two black state senators by 1874. They're the last until, again, 1960s. Um, they sign off and make it very public of their support of this. And then he flees Georgia for a period of time, lives in Arkansas, eventually would move to Mississippi by 1878. And my contention um, in the book talk about is because of the opportunity that's here uh, in this area. Again, Memphis, I mean, uh, Sardis, Panola, uh, and uh, Holly Springs area. But the other thing that's drawn black people to this area is education. You have Holly Springs Normal School, which is established um, during Reconstruction. It's one of two state teacher schools in the state. The other one, of course, is in Alcorn. But the fact that you have this school located in North Mississippi is no just accident that it happens. It means that there is a, a black community there, a vibrant black community. So black people are moving to Holly Springs because of educational opportunity. They're also moving to um, Holly Springs because you have Russ College that is there, formed as Shaw College um, by the Northern Methodists. Um, and so these are educational opportunities that black people can engage in and, and participate in. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting about the Holly uh, Springs School, Normal School, is that they boasted very openly the fact that they had all black instructors uh, that were from Mississippi, and they were really proud of that. The other thing that's fascinating about Russ College is that Russ College had a law school for a very brief time. Uh, 1878, they have a law school, um, but it doesn't continue to function. And I think part of it is because of the yellow fever outbreak that happens in 1878, uh, which sort of undermines that. But either way, these are reasons why you have black individuals moving to this area of North Mississippi. Um, and so if you look at the numbers, that's one of the things that's fascinating looking at this, um, looking at the uh, black Methodists, uh, because that's one thing they talk about in the book is this competition between black Methodists, because there's a lot of competition. Um, but in 1890, um, you have, well, you know, over 5,000 uh, CME members um, in those three counties. You see AME Zion, AME, and then Methodist Episcopal Church South, I mean, Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, it's around maybe 707. I couldn't really tell clearly from the, the records. Um, but either way, it's well dominated by uh, the CMEs. And a lot of that growth is because once Isaac Anderson comes to Georgia, comes to Mississippi rather, he um, is organizing churches, uh, which is what he had done in Georgia. That's part of the reason why he's elected in 1870 is because he's using his organization of the CME that historians have typically said were not political but he is using his organization of the CMEs um, as a way to, a platform uh, to be able to run for office and again win uh, office in the Georgia legislature in 1870. So he is a great organizer. Uh, and so he organizes a number of CME churches, again, in uh, throughout this region, uh, a number of them uh, in the Mississippi Delta region. And it's fascinating reading as I was working on this, uh, finding out about Hollywood, Mississippi, which I didn't know. What was, where was Hollywood, Mississippi? But all of these little communities that really sort of disappeared, especially once the railroads uh, disappeared. But it was a great lens into understanding uh, the vibrant black community that existed uh, in Mississippi. Um, so um, you uh, see here um, that even in Holly Springs, eventually um, you're going to have 
uh, the CME presence uh, felt most directly uh, in Holly Springs uh, with the creation of Mississippi Industrial College. That college that I first saw, saw years ago uh, when I was traveling through Holly Springs. This is a picture of Catherine Hall. Uh, much of the campus to my, oh, my heartbreak, I can't even look at the pictures now. Every so often I go back and look at the pictures of what MI looks like now and it just, it just, it just makes me hurt inside. Um, uh, because most of the buildings have um, either fallen or just on sort of the last legs of standing. Uh, but either way, um, this Mississippi Industrial College was again a CME school. Uh, and um, it, it, Anderson has a, 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 he establishes a CME church there in Holly Springs, which today bears his name, Anderson Chapel. Uh, and uh, again, really represented a period of time, I think, when black individuals in, Georgia, in Mississippi rather, believed that this was a place of opportunity, land of opportunity. Now, of course, all that would change by 1890. Uh, with the adoption of the new state constitution. And Anderson, who had, I'm sure he had, I know he didn't have spidey sense, but the whole idea that something, ah, this sounds really familiar, he gets up and eventually leaves. And that's when he relocates to Jackson. Um, but that's after the uh, Constitutional Convention of 1890 and the new constitution is adopted and black rights are curtailed, uh, voting rights are curtailed dramatically. Uh, but the, the significance of his story, and this, and this is one little vein in terms of talking about North Mississippi, uh, is so important to understanding why you would have the creation of institutions like this. It helps you to understand why, and I think it's something that historians, I know I want to continue to work on, and I am working on in my next project, but why it's so important to understanding uh, this sort of uh, this idea within the black community about having your own, having institutions that you control, having that autonomy, having those safe spaces uh, where you can grow and your children can grow. But this is a point I wanted to make. I think it's part of the reason why um, it's important to understand why you would have by um, the time of the, by the teens uh, a number of U and I A chapters. Uh, Universal Negro Improvement Associations, uh, Marcus Garvey's organization, would be centered in black rural communities. Of course, there are a lot of black individuals um, who are living there. Again, it's before you have sort of, sort of the second wave of the Great Migration. But I think there's already a, a current of black identity and strength that's already running through those communities that when you have the creation of those UNIA chapters sort of taps into that. And I think we see that in the agency of African Americans looking for economic opportunity, looking for churches and spaces where they can worship, looking for political opportunity, looking for educational opportunities. I think that is one of the things that you see that culminates again in why you would have a number of those chapters located um, in the South. Uh, so uh, Again, this project, I mean, I could talk about it forever, um, but I, I know we sort of are almost out of time here. Uh, but I think learning about these stories and um, these histories that have been forgotten for a number of reasons, whether it be because of trauma, uh, which the book talks about extensively in terms of the black experience, uh, whether it is because of sort of distrust, it's so important to recover these stories, to spend the time and energy, like I said, it took me well over a decade to do this, to recreate the story, to do this, because it's such a valuable to understanding the period of reconstruction, but also to understand why we are where we are today. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we'll take time for questions, and if you would raise your hand, and um, I think Chris will bring the mic over you to you if, you if you have questions, if anyone should have any. Questions? I'll start here. All right, and I'll come back to you. They like to watch me run across okay, the Okay, yes, get your exercise of the day. How are you doing? Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, did you find any evidence that Isaac Anderson was in communication with his father, you know, around that time when he was running for office? Uh, yes. They lived in the same community. Uh, and so, um, 
Yeah, they lived in the same town. Gotcha. And he had bought property from his father. Um, yeah, there. Yeah, there's just lots of connections there. The thing that's really comp I don't know all the ins and outs of their story there, but it is. It's really complicated. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, the second question I had was, did you say Isaac Anderson moved to Holly Springs in 1878? Um, well, he bought property in 1878. He bought property in the middle of the yellow fever pandemic. Right. Um, so he brought property then, but lived sort of in Cullahoma. So on the yeah, sort of outskirts of Holly Springs. Got you. Because mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if he had a chance to interact with um, Jim Wells, who was Ida B. Wells' father, who was living in Holly Springs. Yeah, you know, I haven't run across that at all. And I haven't run any, across of any interaction between him and Ida B. Wells. The only way I see it is that um, in the Christian, uh, the, cult, the CME Church, they had a newspaper. Uh, which he was the editor. I mean, well, he was the uh, publishing agent, so he was, you know, uh, sort of helping to fund it and, and everything, uh, or help to, help, helping it to run. They did carry a column gotcha. by, by Iola. And I think it's cool that you mentioned Harm Rebels because it kind of adds to this narrative that you got going of that being a place of freedom. After he leaves Alcorn, he eventually moves to Holly Springs, passes at Asbury Baptist Church, or is it? I Methodist very Church. Yeah, mm -hmm. Methodist. Mm -hmm. um, and then he teaches at Russ College. And so, again, that adds, that's another example to your point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question from the live stream. Um, Sarah Campbell asks, where did you get your numbers for church membership in Panola, Tate, and Marshall counties? There is a census of um, church denominations, and I just don't have it right in front of me, um, that lists all the different denominations and in 1890, and that's why I use that number. Um, and so you can see across the board, all across the country. And so what I did is I just went through each state, looked at each county, and I could see which denomination, how, how many, uh, according to wherever they were. So that was, that's where I got those numbers from. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very interesting and revelatory presentation. Thank you. It's good to know that economic and educational opportunities in Tate, Panola, Marshall County were such a draw. It's also interesting, though, that he moved to Mississippi three years after Senator Caldwell was assassinated mm -hmm. in Hines County. And at a time when Warren and Lauderdale County had political uprisings with the white Democrats repressing the vote for black mm -hmm. Republicans. How did he end his life? Did he die in Mississippi? Where is he buried? Mm -hmm. And did he always have this confidence that he made the right decision? Yeah. A lot of it, I don't know, no papers, no, anything. I, I will say I had the, the honor to uh, meet uh, and talk with a number of his descendants, which is, was really great in order to providing pictures and some other things, um, and then also some other family history. Um, but I think one of the things you see is that there are these pocket communities. So maybe not all of Mississippi, is like that, and there are the, but there are these sort of carved out pockets where African Americans can live, um, and so I think that is part of the reason why um, this is sort of a unique part of the story. I, I do think by the 1880s um, and late 1880s, and particularly by 1890, it's like okay, I know I'm going to have to get leave here because it's just so similar to what he had seen in Georgia. Um, uh, so I think that is part of the story of why he would um, leave. And he, he eventually he moves to Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, and that is where um, he, uh, which is really interesting, part of this, another part of the story is, um, is that he, um, he's in charge of the publishing house there. And um, he also ends up opening a business. Uh, there in Jackson is a very successful businessman in many ways like his father had been in Fort Valley. So that's the other thing that's sort of interesting part because it's because I had my students well, well they read my book I was part of class. Uh, anyway so because we were talking about reconstructions I had them read it and one of the questions I asked at the end is is he his father's son because of the fact of how uh, as, an, as a young man who was enslaved he works for his father's business, who his father is tied to the slave system itself. 
uh, which is really complicated. And the whole story is complicated. And then at the end, he is able to sort of be like his father in the sense of he's a successful businessman there in Jackson. Um, and um, yeah, and he ends up, uh, he's on the board of Lane College. Uh, helps to fund Lane College and is on the board there. He also, one of the things which is dear to his heart is education for children. So one of the things that he does is he establishes a school there in, um, in Jackson, Tennessee for, for black children, just like he had done in Fort Valley, uh, uh, which becomes Fort Valley State University. So he has, oh, he is buried in Jackson, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And it's a, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the cemetery right now. I can't remember the name of the cemetery. We visited it and walked all through there one summer. Um, but there are a number of CMEs. It's, a, it's a historically, uh, it's on the historic register of, because uh, uh, it's an African-American cemetery located there in Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where he's buried. Question over here. You talked about the two schools in Holly Springs and Russ College mm -hmm. thrives, does well, still there across the street. The Industrial College, uh, I've seen that. It, it, does, it looks sad. Do we know why one thrived and one did not? Uh, well, I think part of the story, I mean, there are a number of things that are part of it. Elias Cottrell, who would be elected bishop um, in 1892 of the CMEs, that is his project is Mississippi Industrial. And one of the things he really brags about is, you know, having, and that's one of the things interesting about sort of the, the, the dynamics between MI and, and Rust, um, is that he always brags about the fact that this is a, a MI is a school that has an all black board of trustees, um, as opposed to Rust. Um, and one of the things that you see is that when the boll weevil infestation happens, and it, he's so dependent upon um, rural you know, farmers who are hit by the boll weevil um, impacted that. Also the great migration out of people. That sort of um, dries up a lot of funding. Of course, the Great Depression hits. So by, by the 1930s, they are really struggling really, really hard um, as an institution, but are able to maintain. Uh, and Russ, on the other hand, is a Methodist, um, Methodist Episcopal school. Uh, so they're able to continue getting funding um, from the Methodists, and it's, this is before, of course, you have the United Methodists, so it's, it's funding from the North. And so they're able to maintain um, because of that. Uh, so there's, it's, it's just a constant struggle, but I think MI you know, tried to do as much as they could uh, to serve uh, their community as much as they could. So. Mm -hmm. We have a comment and a question from the live stream. The comment comes from Sandy Sanderson. She says, thank you. I wondered why my family may have moved from Georgia to Mississippi during the 1870s. And then Jerry Ball asks, uh, sorry, Jerry Bell asks, have you come across any sources on or references to Mount Pisgah CME Church in Okalona during Reconstruction? How are they connected to the CME Church in Holly Springs? I have not. Um, and it's been a while since I uh, did my extensive my work on the CMEs, and that's primarily, uh, you know, focusing specifically on uh, Mississippi and the CME connection. It's been a while. So I know Mount Pixmont sounds familiar. I just don't, it's, it's been a, a couple years out from my dissertation, so I can't remember exactly. Uh, so what happened to the normal school? Uh, and is, was there any connection between the normal school and MI, or are they two completely different th They're places? They're two completely different. What happens is when um, Vardaman is running for governor of Mississippi, he says, I, that's one of the first things I'm going to do is close that school down. And so he closes the school down, uh, and that is used by uh, Elias Cottrell, Bishop Cottrell, uh, again, who was a CME, as a rallying cry um, to get the establishment of MI, um, Mississippi Industrial, by 1905, 1906. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why, too, he emphasizes an all-black institution. Um, he has great connection with Booker T. Washington. Uh, and so one of the things, one of the buildings that, I don't know if it's standing any longer, um, is Carnegie Hall. Um, years ago when I was a, this is one of, I, I sometimes tell my students this because I'm, I'm like, I don't know if I want to encourage them to do this, but when I was a grad student, 
at Mississippi, University of Mississippi, I actually went inside that building in the, in the wintertime with my hard hat on and permission of the groundskeeper and just walked through that building. Um, but uh, yeah, so he was able to get funding. They were able to get funding from Carnegie, matching funds. Uh, to be able to do that, uh, have that building built. But uh, yeah, it is, that's what happened to the Rust School, I mean, uh, the normal school. It closed down. Mm -hmm. I have a question. You mentioned the state militia, the Georgia State Militia. Mm -hmm. Really not, uh, I'm not as familiar with that as I should be. They replaced the KKK in what you had talked about in, in the instance there. Is there a Mississippi equivalent that ever developed for the... Georgia State Militia? Yeah, I don't know. I have not looked um, to see what happened in terms of Mississippi. Um, I just mainly focus in on Georgia to look at those push factors of African Americans out um, and how that connects with, um, you know, Isaac Anderson and, and the, you know, black relocation. Um, so, um, yeah. One more question from the live stream. Um, is, why do you think the CME Church had a reputation for being non-political? Well, um, a couple of things. One is the fact that um, when they had their organizing meeting, there was a stipulation um, that, was, uh, that was offered um, that the church should be non-political. Uh, and the concern, uh, it was more of the white Southern Methodists who were concerned about this because they were concerned about the political activity of the AME and the AME Zion. Uh, and Georgia is, I mean, it is intense in Georgia in terms of the competition between black Methodists in Georgia. And that's why that's another part of the fascinating part of the story. So, um, so for um, the CMEs, when they have that adopt, the, 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 they're established as an organization, um, they are sort of put forth that they're, they're not going to be political. Isaac Anderson stands up and says, no, I don't agree with that we should be able to be politically and politically active. Um, and so the, as an institution, they become sort of non-politically in terms of the white place, individuals that they're in front of, they're not political, but they never oust Isaac Anderson. The same time that they quote unquote sort of adopt this method, three weeks later he's elected to the Georgia legislature. He's not kicked out. Southern Methodists are there in the room with him. Um, when he, you know, it's clear, you know, he's, he's, he's going to be on the, in the Georgia Senate, uh, and he's going to be given even more duties. Um, and I think part of it is because Anderson and other CMEs knew that there were, that they had to, and I think it's a part of the black experience, you, you have to know how to sort of negotiate, the, how you do, so publicly in certain spaces, you may sort of come across a certain way, but in other ways, you are political. So there are other CMEs that are openly involved in politics. They're not kicked out of the denomination. But one of the things that's important to understand for the CMEs is that they uh, were looking for, um, uh, they, 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 again, it's a rural denomination. They're not, they don't have the roots like the AME and AME Zion in urban areas. Churches, you know, they can't get up and just buy a church. So it is this sort of negotiating pragmatism um, and, but they're all the while they are political. And maybe not in the ways that I think most people would think of in terms of maybe running for office, but they are very political. And there are a number of people who have a legacy of being um, uh, challenging, uh, you know, the, the, as the status quo most, um, um, authoring Lucy, um, the graduate, she's a Miles graduate. She's seeing me. There are lots of folks who are seeing me who are very involved. Other questions? If not, we have copies of the book for sale. I'm reading it now. I'm almost finished. It's great. There's a lot more in the book than you were able to get to today. So come over here and see Kim about a copy of that. I hope that we will see you back here next Wednesday for Debbie Douglas and her History's Lunch. And then on Friday for Pico E. Woodsy's talk on getting something to eat in Jackson. But for now, help me thank Alicia Jackson for this fabulous program. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>